you know, I, I think if Donald Trump were on the stage, he'd call Craig Lion Craig, because the fact of the matter is... I'm going to call on Wes Duncan to resign from the race. Welcome to the Republican Men's Club, Attorney General, and Treasurer's Forum. Appreciate everybody attending. I've introduced most of our guests, which we're thankful that everybody is here and everybody is an important guest. Now I'm going to turn over the mic to Cole Azury, and he'll be introducing, first will be our Attorney General candidates. Cole? Hello, welcome to the uh, Attorney General and Treasurer debate. If I could first have Wes Duncan and Craig Mueller both come to the podium. Let's get started. All right, just for clarification, we're gonna quickly go over the rules. Um, there'll be a one minute introduction for both candidates. There'll be one minute a response to each question for each candidate. 30 second rebuttal if you choose. So if you don't choose, we'll just move on to the next question. Just signal me if you wanna do a rebuttal. And then there'll be a two minute closing statement for you guys. All right, are you guys ready? Yeah, absolutely. All right. And this, the yellow placard is for a 30 second warning. And the red means, uh, you know, stop. All right, let's get started. So, we'll start with just a simple here. Craig Mueller on the left. If you would go ahead and make your intro statement, sir. Certainly, my name's Craig Mueller. I'm a 50 year Nevada resident. I went to, grew up in Nevada. I was appointed to and attended the Naval Academy. I served seven years on active duty, another 10 years in the reserve. I've been a self-employed small businessman and a tr practicing trial attorney down in Las Vegas. I want to serve as your attorney general for two or three specific reasons. Number one, I want to sue the federal government and get the Bureau of Land Management out of our state or at least push back and get a lot more land from them. Number two, I want to enforce the state constitution so public employees can't serve in the legislature. I want the constitution enforced. Number three, I want to keep the state the least taxed and least regulated. And at this point, in addition to my opening statement, I'm gonna call on Wes Duncan to resign from the race. He has now been uh, taken $190,000 in campaign contributions as he was serving as attorney general. He's now introduced into this race a pay-for-play scandal, both in the attorney general's race and in the governor's race. Okay, uh, the, the big article in the RJ with the details, he is now uh, uh, going to cause us problems as a Republican Party. Thank you, Mr. Mueller. Mr. West Duncan, if you would have your introduction statement. Sure. Uh, good, <laughs> good afternoon, everybody. My name is Wes Duncan. I'm running for attorney general. I want to make Nevada the safest place uh, to raise a family. You know, in 2008, uh, 2009, I had the opportunity to deploy uh, to Baghdad, Iraq, where we worked at the Central Criminal Court of Iraq, where we helped the Iraqis prosecute terrorists and terror suspects in their court system. And I will tell you that it was a formative uh, experience for me, uh, and then I got to see a uh, country up close and personal where the rule of law had completely broken down, uh, where safety and security uh, were not present. And it was, uh, like I said, very, very formidable. We realized what an exceptional and great country that we have. I served uh, formally seven months ago, uh, finished up as the first assistant, uh, which is the number two at the office. I was a former prosecutor. Uh, was an assemblyman, and I still serve as a reservist at Nellis Air Force Base uh, as a major where I'm the staff judge advocate of a wing of 1,500 people. This, this race is about uh, safety and security. It's about who can lead the state uh, and who can uh, work best with law enforcement to keep our community safe, and I hope I can earn your support. Thank you, sir. All right, without further ado, we will start with the first question. Since Mr. Mueller began with the interest statement, we'll do the first question with Mr. West Duncan. Um, the first question, what is your position on the Second Amendment? What can we do to avoid another Route 91 Harvest Music Festival shooting, which left 58 people dead? Sir, you have one minute. So, i uh, been a strong supporter of the Second Amendment my entire life. Uh, look. The Second Amendment is just as important as any other amendment in the Bill of Rights. It's our individual right to bear arms. I agree with the Supreme Court when they said it's an individual right to do that, to protect yourself, 
and to protect your family. And so support the Second Amendment 100%. Uh, in terms of, of trying to, to, to make sure that we prevent another type of tragedy like Route 91, I think uh, there's two ways, two areas that we can really focus on. The first is mental health uh, in, in our state. Uh, there's a deficit of mental health resources. I've traveled the state, talked to law enforcement, have the support of 15 sheriffs uh, in this race, and they tell me every time we sit down that there's a deficit of resources. So we need psychiatric ERs in our state. We need mobile outreach safety teams to be able to intervene early with people who come and find themselves uh, in the system a lot. The second place that I think that we can uh, help is that uh, you know the state AG can help communication between state, local, and federal law enforcement to better communicate and also work with the tourist corridor to try to keep our communities safe. Thank you, sir. Mr. Mueller, do you want me to repeat the question? or no. oh, You got it? I've got it. Thank All you. All right, so you have one minute. Before I decided to run for office, I actually sat down and read the Constitution. I read the Federalist essays. I read the Federalist papers. I read the Anti-Federalist essays, and I actually took and read the state Constitution. You have a Second Amendment right. The Founding Fathers wanted you to have that gun as, as a final defense against tyranny. That was what they meant. That's what they said. Our state constitution has even broader protections. Article, there's a Declaration of Rights, Section 11, I think it's subsection 1, says you have a right to a firearm for defense, not limited. When I grew up in Nevada, we used to carry, I, not me personally, but people would bring shotguns and leave them in the parking lot in their pickup trucks. Guns aren't the problem, and I agree with Wes on this point, mental health is. And we have underfunded mental health society or system in our state, and now it is coming back to bite us. We need to address mental health. As far as Route 91, I don't know that the facts of the case are out yet. I don't know that's a good subject for comparison. Thank you. And I'll just say, if you guys have a rebuttal, you, this uh, well, is the time. No rebuttal, but the, but the other point is, and, and the Secret Service just put out a report that talked about 28 mass casualty events last year, and the singular generalization that you find uh, with these cases, 66% of folks who partook in mass casualty type uh, attacks, 66% of them had mental health problems, 54% of them had substance abuse problems. So early intervention in both mental health and substance abuse can help uh, a lot in these areas. Thank you, sir. Just for the record, that question, Kate, was submitted by uh, Mr. Tim Fisher. All right. We'll move on to the second question. This question will start with Mr. Mueller. Um, this is by our board chairman, Mr. Board chairman, Mr. Ray Rocha. Uh, what administrative experience do you have? I was a naval officer. I started at 23 years old, being in charge of 14 men. I uh, was fleeted up. I ran a 140 man department on the Jewish Fuhrer as chief engineer. I was reassigned in the Washington where I supervised a 14 or 15 million dollar budget detailing approximately 150,000 sailors for the surface ship fleet uh, in the engineering rates. From there I went and worked in the district attorney's office where I had relatively little supervisory responsibility. But since then I've run my own business successfully for 25 years and at one time we were up to about 23, 24 employees. Thank you, sir. Mr. West Duncan. Uh, so uh, just six months ago, I was the first assistant attorney general where I helped Attorney General Laxalt uh, manage a 400-person office. I ran all the southern uh, Nevada operations where we were in charge of a legislative agenda, uh, the budget, uh, working uh, with law enforcement. That's why I have the uh, confidence of law enforcement in this race. We were able to build those type of relations, uh, relationships, so helped manage a 400-person office. I'm also the staff judge advocate at the 926 wing at Nellis Air Force Base, and I'm a major there where I'm the top legal advisor to 1,500 personnel. And so we provide legal advice to the uh, wing commander who's very tantamount to uh, governor of a state and your uh, squadron commanders would be like your government uh, heads. And so I feel very comfortable in terms of uh, leading people. You know, the Attorney General's office is about leadership. It's about, it's the confluence of leadership, of the law, and also of working with law enforcement. And I feel good about my experience uh, about uh, taking the reins and uh, continuing the office. Thank you. I would like to rebut that. It, 30 uh, seconds, sir. I rebut that. The Attorney General in this state is the chief litigator for the state. You supervise 160 trial attorneys. You advise people on how things are going to work and look in court. I don't know how you do that if you've never been to court and you've never won jury trials. 
It is not an administrative agency. You can't replace, replace the Attorney General with a guy who's read Time Magazine. It's not how it works. We need someone who can actually go into court and present cases in court and evaluate lawyers who are going to present cases in court. Thank you. 30 seconds, sir. <laughs> Thanks a lot. You know, I, I think if Donald Trump were on the stage, he'd call Craig Lion Craig, because the fact of the matter is, Craig and I tried cases against each other at the district attorney's office, and uh, specifically Dayroom Mitchell case, where you wanted an offer on a Friday, I said no deal, we took it on Monday, and you sent your associate in, Craig. So we can talk about that. I've tried military cases, okay? I've tried cases as a prosecutor in Clark County, and specifically, uh, yes, you are the chief litigator. We both have prosecution experience, uh, and we have a lot of prosecution experience, but it's a leadership position. Craig's talking about the solicitor general in the office. Yes, your attorney general has to have experience. Yes, they need to go into court, but it is a leadership right. experience. Thank you, sir. All right. Hopefully this question won't be quite as contentious. Um, this one was just recently submitted, and I decided to add it to the list because I think it could be very interesting as we have a ballot initiative regarding it. Um, Massachusetts Attorney General recently called for an end to their deregulated energy markets because of the false promises of lower rates and improper targeting of low-income elderly and minority residents. Illinois and Pennsylvania AGs have been forced to end energy choice in their states. Our own PUC came out yesterday with its evaluation of the Energy Choice Initiative in which it concluded the first 10 years at least residential customers will see an, increased energy, an increase in energy rates. Where do you stand on energy choice? We'll start with Mr. West Duncan. Yeah, and I will tell you, when, when you first talk about the idea of deregulation, it sounds like a, uh, you know, a free market thing that all good Republicans or conservatives uh, would support. Uh, look, I saw the PUC um, study yesterday and, and, and the impacts. Uh, so I, I'm going to take a look at both sides of, of the argument. I will tell you, I, I felt like it uh, would be 100% where the voters were at this last uh, cycle. But really, uh, kind of at a place right now, I haven't made my mind up. The role of the Attorney General, though, is, is you have the Consumer Advocate and you have the Bureau of Consumer Protection. And so um, one of the roles of the Attorney General is that you make sure that the rates in the state stay in balance and that uh, rate payers uh, don't get bilked uh, by entities within the state. And so um, I'm looking forward to looking at the issue, quite frankly, a, a little bit more in depth and then making up my mind. Thank you, sir. Mr. Craig Mueller. I'm opposed to it, for the, actually for very different reasons. I'm all for conservative principles and deregulation, and I agree that sounds very promising. What experience I have had, however, was I was also an electrical officer in the Navy. And the one thing about electrical power that makes it unique is the minute supply and demand are not equal, the system collapses. You need a constant supply and demand. The, as it's written, it's going to mandate the legislature to pass laws. We remember how well that worked with marijuana and medical marijuana. The legislator sat on that for a long time. It's got to be significantly better thought out, and it doesn't belong in the state constitution. Now, it is a potentially workable idea, but ask the people at Enron how well it worked. All right? If that, if, all right? As a practical matter, electric utility is not like buying a bucket of paint or a gallon of milk where you can go with the lowest cost provider. There's infrastructure costs, there's balancing costs. It doesn't make sense to put it in the state constitution. I'm opposed to it, and having said that, it's almost certainly gonna pass. <laughs> Thank you. Is there any rebuttal on this? All right, seeing no rebuttal, we will move on to question four. What is this, is this question came from uh, a Kenny Epstein. What is the future of online gaming in Nevada? Do you support mobile sports betting. Um, I think we started, who started? You started first, so it's your turn, Craig. Thank you. I am opposed to internet gaming. The reason I'm opposed to internet gaming, because if gaming bets or wages pass straight lines, that becomes interstate commerce, and that makes it federal regulations, and we here in Nevada would potentially lose, in fact, almost certainly eventually will lose the lead on gaming regulation. I do not, I do not support internet gaming. Mobile gaming devices that stay inside state lines, I don't have any problem with. That's a, it may, it's a state function. Interstate commerce is a federal function. Even I, an ardent state rights guy, has to concede that. And if we get involved in that, we're going to lose 
The other practical problem is we now have gaming companies down on the strip that have national rather than Nevada interests. And this is we're in an uncomfortable place where what's good for the strip may not be good for Nevada. Thank you, sir. Mr. West Duncan. Yeah, so, the, so the question of, of online gaming is one that's been left to the province of the legislature uh, for years and years and years. Right now we have online gambling that was passed in, uh, by SB9 in 2013. Um, and so really the question of where online gaming goes is going to be a policy question whether they tackle that at the state level or whether the federal government through the restoration of the Wire Act or, or a number of other bills that have been introduced tackles internet gaming in that way. I'll say for sports betting, uh, there was a case that was argued this term in the U.S. Supreme Court that deals with the Professional Amateur Sports Protection Act that was passed in 1992. Nevada was grandfathered in as one of four states uh, with Oregon, uh, Delaware, Montana that allow sports betting. And all the gaming uh, casinos in the state have mobile sports apps that allow people to place bets. But sports betting could very much change uh, in the next couple of months as there's been about 25 states that have passed uh, legislation that should uh, the Supreme Court strike, strike down PASPA, uh, that they will put uh, sports betting in place, and that could have an impact uh, here in Nevada. We, we have $250 million a year in revenue just off of sports betting in our state. Thank you. Is there a rebuttal to this question? No, sir. All right. Seeing none, we will move on to question five. This was submitted by Miss Karen Conrad, one of our awesome volunteers who helps us out every month. And that's my phone. Um, should, yeah, silence all phones, please. Should we move the mentally ill out of our jails and into institutions designed to treat their illness? If yes, what could you do to make this happen? I believe you're starting, Mr. West Duncan. Sure. So, you know, since 1955, we've seen deinstitutionalization. At the height of 1955, there were about 500,000 people that were in mental institutions, and then uh, with the advancement of medicine, being able to treat people. Uh, when Lyndon Johnson in 1965 uh, signed Medicaid into law, Medicaid didn't pay for mental institutions, so they moved folks out of mental institutions into uh, clinics where they can get men mental health treatment. Look, as I've been touring the state, I will tell you, again, law enforcement 100% says that now what used to be treated in mental institutions is now being treated in the criminal justice system. And so I believe that we need psychiatric ERs like we, we have one right here working really well at the Mallory Center in Carson City. Uh, we need mobile outreach safety teams that can intervene early with people that frequently fly uh, through the system. And so I think the state really should look at uh, trying to address mental health in a meaningful way uh, dedicating resources uh, to there. The other big systemic problems, there's federal, there's a federal overlay and there's a state overlay with how much resources that they want to do. Thank you, sir. Mr. Craig Mueller. Thank you. The current standard for uh, uh, detaining someone against their will is called a legal 2000. And what they do is they've got to, if, if a concerned law enforcement officer, family member demonstrates that the suspected individual is a threat to themselves or to the others, they can be detained for up to uh, 72 hours. The problem is that standard is so narrow and, and as a practitioner, and I'm a guy who goes to court every day, there's not a day goes by where there's not somebody with serious mental health issues in court. Wes's assessment is actually the correct one. We have deferred mental and psychiatric treatment to the jails. It doesn't work very well. And the problem was, is there was such a system of abuse, the last generation, that the, the generation that came after that made it very hard to detain someone against their will. We need the psychiatric hospitals. We need long-term fixes. I agree. Thank you. And two, I mean, 30 to, seconds, sir. To, to Craig's point, too, Nevada happens to find itself as one of the more uh, severe states in the union. For every one person who's in uh, a mental institution or, or receiving mental health care access, there are 10 people that are receiving the same access and care in our Department of Corrections. And so we've absolutely made a shift there. And look, another role of the Attorney General is to be proactive on these type of of, uh, of issues, and we need to get proactive in mental health and early intervention. It needs to start in our schools and it needs to start in our communities. Thank you. 
Do you want to, yeah, we, else? I, I actually call and agree and call with him. We need some psychiatric hospitals in the state. There's no argument. And even a tight-fisted Republican, I agree that we need to spend some money on that. Thank you. All right. We're going to go to question six. This will be our final question, and then we'll move on to the uh, closing statements. Uh, question six. This was submitted by Mr. Jeff Masters. What type of cases have you tried, and what was your most challenging case? I saw the question coming, and I gave it a lot of thought. I was just telling uh, uh, my table about having been up all night worrying about a, a court-appointed death penalty case I had handled once. But that wasn't the toughest case. Most stressful, but wasn't the toughest. Um, I've also done a number of medical malpractice cases over the years. I've stopped taking them because they're just horrible cases. You've got a doctor who made a, a mistake, who doesn't want to admit it. You've got a family member who's uh, been hurt or killed uh, that didn't need to happen. Those cases are just horrible. And the t most difficult case I had was a doctor withdrew medication and caused sepsis and death. And it is just, th those are without a doubt, criminal cases come and go. Those medical malpractice cases as a professional, personal matter are without a doubt the toughest. And, and thank God I don't have any more of them. Thank you. Mr. West Duncan. Look, I think um, when I was a prosecutor, trying um, child sexual assault uh, cases are very, very difficult because you're dealing with a, a young victim uh, who has a very hard time uh, testifying and you have criminal defense attorneys like Craig who are representing a client and really going after those victims. And so those are very difficult cases uh, to, to do. I'll tell you uh, also when we were in Iraq helping the Iraqis prosecute cases, they were decades and decades behind our system. So for example, we were trying to help them put fingerprint evidence in or forensic type evidence that we take for granted every day. Uh, so those cases were very difficult. In the military, uh, I tried a lot of cases, uh, over 40 court martials uh, in federal military tribunals. The fraud cases were always very, very difficult uh, because of the heavy paper intensity. And uh, so, you know, there's a range of different types of cases uh, that, that, that are difficult. The ones that affect children, uh, the real violent crime uh, cases that affect kids uh, are especially hard. Thank you so much. And any rebuttals, 30 seconds if you do? Well, I'm not quite sure what my colleague is, which part of the Bill of Rights he wants uh, repealed. But the answer is, is everyone's entitled to aggressive defense. Uh, specifically, I've handled all sorts of cases, many cases he doesn't know anything about. I've done civil cases. I've done uh, civil defense. I've been a, uh, done insurance defense. I've been in municipal court where he's not been. I've done administrative law. I've done all sorts of different types of cases. Respectfully, they're all difficult in their own way. But the question he asked me was, what were personally the most difficult cases? And the most personally difficult cases was where you had two wrongs and that was uh, and two rights, and you had to sort it out. Thank you. Thirty right. seconds. I think too. He's absolutely correct. Everybody is entitled uh, to an attorney, uh, but Craig chooses his clients. He chooses the clients that he takes. And so, if you even Google. Craig Mueller and the type of cases that he's taken, these are people that are dangers to the community. I mean, while we've been in this race, he's represented a, a cop who sexually, you know, allegedly sexually assaulted a youth, and he claimed that he wasn't a danger to the community, and then the guy was barricading himself and the police had to intervene. And so when you are gonna, trying to be the top law enforcement officer in the state where you have to advocate for victims and be the top law enforcement officer, that credibility matters. Thank and you, that's Pat. exactly we, why he's not actually, fit for the is, office. There's not a rebuttal to rebuttal, sir. I appreciate it, but I can't, can't go back and forth too far. All right, let's go on to closing statements, guys. So I believe you, you started the last question. So wait, did you start the last question? Yes? Yes. So Wes Duncan's going to do the closing statement. Great. Well, thank, thank you so much. It was, it's been a great opportunity just to to discuss the issues that the Attorney General's office uh, faces. Look, you are the top law enforcement officer, you're the top legal advisor uh, to the state. I've got the uh, endorsement of Attorney General Laxalt, 15 sheriffs across the state, 15 district attorneys, five chiefs of police. Uh, people are responding to the message about trying to keep our safe uh, state and making it a safer place. I've got two young boys, four and three, a baby daughter on the way. I want to be able to look them in the eyes and say that we did everything that we could to try to make this state a safer place. And so uh, I've got the leadership experience. I've got the uh, experience in the courtroom uh, on behalf of victims working with law enforcement, looking victims in the eye. Uh, and uh, I hope that I'll be able to earn 
uh, your support, and I hope that you'll join me uh, in my vision for a safer Nevada. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. West Duncan. Mr. Craig Mueller, your closing statement. Mr. Duncan has provided and presided over a dramatic increase in crime in the state. Crime is up in Las Vegas. It's up rather dramatically, almost a doubling of crime in the last few years. For a man who wants to make Nevada a safer state, he didn't put on a business suit, he never picked up a file, and he never walked into court. He cannot and will not articulate any policy difference he changed. Specifically, the attorney general who gets elected this next cycle is going to be the attorney general that presides over redistricting. The attorney general that presides over this state uh, at the turn of the next uh, redistricting is in charge of whether we even exist as a political party. If we get redistricted out of power for 10 years, that's going to be what needs, or we got to protect against what happening. Now, specifically, I am going to run the office by walking around. The first day I am there, I'm going to pick up a file and I'm going to go to court so that every one of those district attorneys or one of those, every one of those attorney generals know that you are expected to go to trial and you are expected to aggressively represent the office. It is not a bureaucracy, it is a litigation office. Specifically, you saw that insight. Everybody is guilty? Well, why do we have a legal system? We don't need an attorney general. We need a political or a politician general. Now, that's young man's reasoning. I've represented people who have passed polygraphs, had to go to trial for life sentences, and they were exonerated. If they were all guilty, we don't need attorneys and we don't need an attorney general's office. He's not qualified for the office. And he did not address the fact that he's taken $190,000 and has put himself in a fundraising right. scandal. Thank you, sir. Well, uh, thank you both for attending this forum. Uh, this, this is one of the more... If I could, uh, thank you both. I want to shake your hand. Thank you for coming. I'm going to turn the mic over to Ray Rocha for an announcement. I want to thank both of them for debating and answering questions. They'll be available after the meeting to answer questions. The audio of these debates can be found on iTunes and Stitcher Radio. Just Google Timelines of Success or Meet the Voter. We thank you for tuning in and listening and make your vote count. Study the candidates closely and we'll see you at the next forum at the Republican Men's Club. Until then, take care. Hi, this is Bill and thank you for watching. Go ahead and if you're not signed in, sign into your Gmail, go right up here and subscribe to RMC TV. You can go over here, watch a couple more videos, link to our website at republicanmenisclub.org. And finally, make sure you go down and leave a comment. The comments really help. See you on the next video.